So I used to live in Montreal. Um, I lived in a poor neighborhood. And uh, one day I was out in the back alley building a fence because I was putting a little fence around my, back, my little tiny backyard. And there was a house across the alley down the street a ways where there was a lot of like not good partying. A lot of bikers were hanging around there. And I knew there was a little kid that lived there as well. Anyways, I was out there in the back alley pounding away on my fence and these little kids came up and they were little. They were like three and four years old, hey? And they spoke uh, Jouel, right? Uh, kind of uh, really heavily accented Quebecois French. And so I, my French isn't good. So I could hardly understand them. But they were, wa they were watching me hammer and they got a little closer. And they had one, one kid who was clearly the leader had a real scowl on his face, hey? And so they were watching and I kind of motioned to one of them that they could use the hammer. And that kid said, uh, and I, I'm going to mangle this, but he said, je vole, or something like that. And what it meant is, I'll steal that. And so I thought, you know, and then he came over and he tugged on it and he wanted me to take it. And he was quite angry and, well, I wasn't going to let him take it. And then so, so I couldn't engage him. I couldn't get him to play, you know, and his buddies were sort of hanging around behind him. And they wouldn't come and play because he wouldn't. And so he was hostile right away to me. And then... <laughs> So the fence piece was laying out in the alley, and these little monsters started running across it, which I thought was really remarkable, you know. But it was terrible at the same time, because they were really little kids. That shouldn't be happening when you're like three or four. If that's happening at that age, things are not good. And so that kid was already like seriously not happy with the world. And, you know, I'd been studying antisocial behavior for a long time by that point, and I knew that the kids who were destined to jail later in their lives are kids who are rough and tough when they're two years old, but then don't get socialized. Or maybe worse, they get anti-socialized, which is exactly what happened to this kid. He'd obviously been ignored and abused. Um, certainly no one had ever played with him in any real way because he, he wouldn't play. And it's not good if a kid is that little and you can't get them to play. Something's gone seriously wrong. Because they're so playful at that age that like, it's like 90% of them. Anyway, so they were running back and forth on this fence, I thought, stomping on it, you know? And I was right there! I thought, well, I, first of all, I thought that was remarkable, but I also thought it was absolutely horrifying, because, you know, in some sense I could see where this kid was headed and why, at that early stage in his life, it's really, it's not a pleasant thing to behold, you know? But there was nothing that could be done about it, and that's kind of what this Lampwick is like, he's prematurely cynical. This kid was already cynical, and he was like four years old. You know, most kids don't get cynical till they're teenagers. You know, and then often they don't get completely cynical and usually they more or less grow out of it. But he, it had happened to him much earlier. So this Lampwick character, he'd already, he's already decided that he knows everything, that everyone else is, his opinion is worth nothing, and that there's nothing in culture or society that holds any use, utility whatsoever for someone like him. Now you can imagine developing that way if you were raised in a family where people were gen generally lying to you and that they randomly treated you or neglected you and that you couldn't discern anything about them that was admirable or positive you know, it's, it's, of course you'd assume that the whole structure is corrupt and that you had to take care of yourself and no one else well not of course, not everyone assumes that under those situations I shouldn't say of course but it's a, but it's a logical set of conclusions so and of course, it's proportionate to some degree to how much abuse you take. Although, there are lots of stories of people who've been terribly abused as children who grew up to be, you know, kind, remarkable, responsible, thoughtful people who were absolutely opposed to abuse instead of propagating it. There's no direct causal pathway. Anyways, Lampwick is pretty happy to be on this, uh, on this coach way to Pleasure Island, which he's heard about. He said, well, it's all you can eat, it's all you can smoke, you don't have to do any work, and you can do anything you want. So, you might say, well, it's too good to be true. Like the gingerbread house in the Hansel and Gretel story. Right? The kids are lost, there's a gingerbread house. It's a house, which is something they need, and it's made out of cookies. It looks like it's a little bit too good to be true. And of course, in the house, there's a, the negative part of that, which is the old witch who wants to eat children. And that's a story about what happens to people if they're offered more than they should be offered. So, 
Anyways, Lampwick is firing off, uh, he has a little slingshot, and he's firing off pebbles at the horses who are pulling the carriage, and that's just kind of the guy that he is. So he takes Pinocchio under his wing, and the cricket is down there in the dust. He's caught back up to the carriage, but he's, uh, he's, in, he's having a rough time at this point. And this is also a story to some degree about the transition into adolescence, you know, because adolescence is a time people are still pretty impulsive and their view is quite short term and they're more likely to pursue immediate pleasures and, and all of that and that can get really out of hand so anyways they separate from the mainland and go on a boat and so they're off to Pleasure Island dark place and uh, the coachman opens the gates and lets the delinquents into Pleasure Island and they basically have a riot and this is Pleasure Island here uh, it's full of amusement park rides and you know one of the things that's kind of interesting about horror movies you, I'm sure you've noticed this is that they're often set in amusement parks and clowns are often characters of horror we'll leave the clowns aside for now but the amusement park thing that's pretty interesting it's like why in the world would an amusement park be a place of horror and the first question might be, well, have you ever been to an amusement park? Because there is something about them that's really, they have a dark side, a clear dark side. And part of it is that people with nothing better to do are spending money stupidly. And they're being fleeced by the people who operate the, the amusement park. You know, and they have, let's say, a stereotypically dark reputation. And they're moving around all the time which is also something that psychopaths do and all they're doing is moving from community to community and taking the money from the rubes fundamentally and so the, the amusement park well if you walk through an amusement park with that sort of thing in mind maybe that's also coloring your vision of course but it's something that you can see very immediately so there's something about them that's sort of deeply sad but there's also that under there's an underlying horror that characterizes them that it's easy for horror movie and, or horror novel writers to immediately expand upon and there's something about it that that makes sense to people so it's too easy maybe that's and it's also all short-term gratification that's the other thing so you spend your money very rapidly and it's gone yep well it seems like a sort of a celebration of meanings towards the back of reality yes exactly well that's the impulsive element the, the comment was it's a celebration of of meanings divorced from reality. Yeah, that's well, it's also outside of reality, right? That's why it's on an island. It's, it's a separate universe. And it's a universe where nothing that's happening is connected to anything outside. And you're spending your hard earned money, let's say, but it isn't that much, it's certainly not an investment. It's not that much different than burning it. Well, it is, because of course you get some pleasure out of it, but, but it isn't. Going there every day is probably not the wisest move that you could make. So, the animators do a good job of, of, well, of presenting the, what would you call it, the enforced hedonism, I guess I would say, of a place like that. This is a place where you're going to have fun. That's what it's for. So, anyways, Lampwick, who's got this very arrogant look on his face and this kind of strut, it's a, it's a bravado, that's what that's called, it's a false confidence and it's, it's, it's the sort of thing that people do when they're trying to impress upon others that they're high in the dominance hierarchy, but really they're not. So it's a mimicry of, of dominance, but it's something that can, that can be intimidating, there's no doubt about it. Um, I had a friend, he, he, he he didn't come to a good end, this, this person. He was a real good friend of mine when I was in junior high and high school, and he was kind of crazy. And uh, he was tall. He was about six foot seven, and he was pretty thin. And we used to go out to the bar now and then, and in many of the bars that we were in, we were, lived in this little town, there were bullies. And these were guys, and I worked in the bars, and I used to watch these guys, and they'd basically, there was a handful of them in town, pretty psychopathic types. And they'd go to the bar, and all they'd do is sit there and wait for someone to come in who they could beat up. And they knew who it was as soon as they walked in. That's actually why they were at the bar. And so they'd wait till someone came in who didn't look very confident, and 
who could likely be intimidated by, by this sort of thing, and then they'd tell them to come outside for a fight, and if they didn't, well then they'd of course make fun of them, and if they did, well generally they'd beat them up. My friend kind of caught on to this trick, and he started going to bars, and every time that someone like that came near him, he'd go outside and fight with them. And one of the things he observed right away is that almost inevitably when he went outside with them, they'd shake hands and make friends. So as soon as he, and it was really remarkable watching him, because he, he wasn't, he wasn't a particularly physically powerful person, although he was extraordinarily tall. But he had started to play this game, and he did it for a long time. And I don't remember him ever actually having to fight. He just stared them down, fundamentally. So, it was a very interesting thing to watch. But it, it, it was an indication to me of exactly how shallow this kind of bravado bullying actually is.